Podcast City Network. You're listening to the Everest Lee Show. Welcome everyone to the Everett Lee Show. I'm the Everett Lee. Today on the program, I have a guest that's been an announcer, play-by-play commentary for the last 11 years. He's announced wrestling shows such as War Wrestling and other promotions, which we'll get into on the program today, DBI, and he's part of a podcast with Ripper Blackheart from Future Great Wrestling. Tales from the Indies. So I'm going to welcome to the program today, Michael McCormick. How you doing? Great. How are you? Not too bad. Not too bad. I know we were talking about audio difficulties and problems right before we hit the record button here. I was telling you last night, which a lot of people will not get to see, is for the fact that I had audio t- technical difficulties with with when I was doing an interview with Cody Hawk last night, which is just something that's going to be later on. I'm sure I'm going to release on the back burner for a blooper reel. <laughs> and he's so great too, because we had him on tales from Indies and I've known Cody for years and we gave him a microphone and just let him go for two hours. I mean, that, uh, that turned out to be a whole different thing because he was in a different headspace than he is now, but he's, he's great. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he was he was great. What we talked about with the with the topics we talked about talking about HWA and just just early wrestling, future great wrestling, and a lot of other stuff too. Which that episode at this time of this recording will be dropped on Saturday on May sixteenth. But by this time this comes out, the episode will already be out though. But it it was a great conversation just getting to talk with him because people kept telling me for a long time you need to get Cody Hawk on you need to get him on and I finally met reached out to him and said hey I want to come on every Lee show and he said let's do it so rest is pretty much history well and it's crazy too because you know you go through you probably take an hour for all the guys that he's influenced or that he's trained or that he's fought and it, uh, those cage matches with Moxley we used to get America One when I was a kid the network that they were on nationally and people don't understand how big of a deal that is now. And I'm sure he talks about it, but it's, you know, from Ohio to Florida and halfway to California every week they're on. And I remember, you know, anybody you can think of that's gone through WWE or then WCW system with them being an affiliate or them being their, uh, where their talent came from. And John Cena was down there. And I know Joe Dombrowski's got uh, from the heartland. He's got a DVD that he put out, not to, free plug the guy but he did a terrific job and i have uh, some hwa stuff from back in the day and it's people don't realize how different in the last 25 years wrestling is to go from that satellite system and you've got wcw and you've got vince and then philly with ecw and stuff but that's it you know indie promotions feed the big guys and if you need proof look at the roster now and I, we actually have a podcast we just taped with Danny Daniels, who runs AEW in Chicago. He's, you know, this kid named Tyler Black. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, Seth Rollins, if, if you haven't seen it. But, I mean, Moxley's the AEW champ. You know, you've got all these guys. Look at Japan. Uh, it, probably in about a week or so, it's going to come out about Doc Gallows and Carl Anderson going back out there. Well, guess what? Carl Anderson's a Cincinnati guy, too trained with less stature, but it's amazing to me. I, I love seeing that. And I, I didn't realize till till uh, about two weeks ago, Tyler Black did this thing when he was 18 years old where he went from Iowa to Buffalo to get noticed, and Danny Daniels was a part of it, and he tells the story too, but he wrestled everywhere, including war, and he worked a guy who had just been released from WWF named Dean Jablonski. I saw Tyler Black when he was 18 and thought, that guy's going to be a star, Worked with Moxley when he was 19. That guy's going to be a star. That's where your stars come from. Yeah. Yeah. Speak, speaking of H, HWA, you you also did some stuff in HWA yourself there back, back years ago, didn't you? Yeah, about the 15th incarnation of it. Oh, yeah. Um, we got to do, Ripper and I did commentary for, I want to say it's five shows um, during the, 
anybody who knows anything about HWA, the last incarnation is the, the only way to say it. And we got to do a reunion show a couple of years ago because of Cody at Bogarts in Cincinnati. And that had, uh, oh, what's his name this week? Eli Drake. Yeah. Uh, Dick Rick was his name when he was in HWA the first time. But it's amazing, you know, the, the things you get to do. If you're half decent at your job, I like to think I am after all this time. But, you know, you, you make friends, you make connections, you kind of branch out a little bit. And those are amazing times. I mean, the talent that came through even that incarnation, HWA, AJ was there and it was in, I can't believe Ripper didn't tell the story, actually, because I listened to his podcast and I thought it was coming up. Yeah. It was in a rundown Ponderosa in Middletown, Ohio, which was uh, where LSC, Legends of the Squared Circle, ran. And AJ gets up, he's doing a seminar in the corner. They're using the six side of ring and he gets up in the corner and says, well, I guess I'm not going to do anything from up here. Because <laughs> he about hit his head. He had this much room. <laughs> you know, it's just one of those crazy things. You hang around in wrestling long enough and you really do see everything. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's amazing. Yeah, he he talked a lot about he talked about a lot about war wrestling, and I've checked out war wrestling over the last year, couple years here and there with different talent that I've had on that's went through there. Almost about everyone I've had on my show here has went through that promotion one time, or they've spent a lot of time in that promotion, and then they move on to working a lot on other promotions. But everything always goes back to war, war wrestling. Well, you can draw, uh, let me think, I, th I think I figured six guys right now that, for instance, are on Impact Wrestling have been, at one point or another, in big feuds. Uh, Ethan Page, who's won half of the Tag Team Champions with the North. Sammy Callahan, who is a fascinating story by himself because the first time he did it, he was 300 pounds as Cannonball Callahan right. when he was training back in HWA. And then he became a version of the Sammy you see now. Um, let's see. Uh, Jake something was the war wrestling champion for a long time. He's on, he's cousin Jake, uh, Rohit Raju or, uh, Hakeem Zane, the mad dragon. Who else? Uh, well, the Chris brothers have been through there a handful of times. Mm -hmm. Um, and I know there was a couple of more Jessica havoc who, by the way, claims to be from defiance, Ohio as part of the gimmick. Defiance, Ohio is about an hour from my house. And it always makes me laugh. <laughs> I'm not going to spill the beans, but she's from somewhere else. Okay. Okay. Different part of Ohio. All right. <laughs> but it, it is fascinating, though, because it's kind of one of those hidden gem things in a way of, uh, you know, people come to war. And I don't know how many people know the story, but Test, Andrew Martin, his only indie appearance after he got let go from WWE was in Lima, Ohio. Really? And then, unfortunately couple weeks later he passed away but uh, it's it's cool it, it's really neat to be able to see and the guys who there who are there now i mean they work their tails off and there's a reason guys come back there you know big tom takes care of them and uh, it's it's a neat place to work yeah it's it it's amazing the talent that that's come through there again i mean jake something i've seen him on future great wrestling fgw shockwave when I when I seen him, I because that's the first time I've actually seen him was on FGW because I'm familiar with Impact, but not really. I know like this person or that person wrestles there, but I I don't watch. Well, Impact. I'm far more nerdy. It's been a while. <laughs> Seeing these people for a dozen, you know, twelve, fifteen years, it kind of oh, that's okay. That's who that is. Yeah, yes. But when when I seen him come on come out there I, I i said to myself i said i said there's something there is something about jake something and he, he was just great the matches his matches that i've seen him have there in fgw i loved it i definitely loved well, what's it, crazy man. about it too is and i give jake all the credit in the world i love jake he's he gets it you know he's one of those guys where he actually was part of a team back in the day called the painkillers and he was about half of the person that he is now you can find it, I believe it's on YouTube, it's on the early war wrestling stuff. War 10 is one of the uh, the events, but they used to have matches where they were one of my favorite tag teams. 
because of the stuff they could do. And they got the psychology of it because Delirious, who trains for Ring of Honor, they went out to Philadelphia and went through their training and stuff. And they also get to pick Truth Martini's brain, who is a tremendous uh, mind in the Michigan area and runs the House of Truth. And a lot of different guys they ro- ride up and down the road with. But, man, he... I, I hate to use it as a thing, but he really is something else. Uh, that kid has, has spent a lot of time in the gym, obviously. Yeah. Not getting a haircut, you know, social distancing and all that, but <laughs> it is a tremendous talent, and I hope that, you know, people recognize that. And he's doing well, though, on Impact right now. Yeah, I'm going to have to... I am definitely going to have to go and look up some more on Jake something. I Here in the last few weeks, I've just been given and come across a lot of great stuff that I've not normally spent time to sit down and watch on YouTube because there's so much good independent wrestling out there because I've gotten away from WWE there for a while. And ways to access it too. Yeah, yeah. It's it's almost like the um, tape trading days. You know, the back <laughs> right, in the day, right. because everyone's done that. Did I'm I'm sure you did that yourself there. What and what uh, what tapes did you trade back and forth? Oh man, I mean, <laughs> don't mean to put see, you on the spot here. <laughs> right, this is the how old are you thing. I was this old when. Um, <laughs> I mean, we had uh, family video is kind of a dying breed, but. They had old WWF tapes back in the day, and then ECW was a lot of it because we got uh, ECW on the satellite service. It was usually Friday nights, I think around midnight. My dad would let us watch it, and I remember just just seeing it and just thinking, this is crazy. I need more of this, you know, and being 10, 12 years old, you can only get so much of it, but... Kind of that stuff, I, I'm actually, I'm always sad that I didn't really, I don't want to say recognize or get into the indies until I was much older mm-hmm. and spent a couple of years at war and just sort of came into with my background of broadcasting of, hey, you know, we want to do these videos, we want to get out of this bubble, so to speak, and I wish I had seen more of it because there used to be so many other great promotions around, and there are now. Yeah. But that I would have went to and seen guys that, all right, turn on your TV on Monday, turn on your TV on Friday, Wednesday, whatever. Those guys are there, but mostly just, you know, some WWF and ECW because I was lucky growing up. My mom used to let us have, I remember SummerSlam specifically, we'd have a party because it was always two days before school started. Mm-hmm. Now it's, of course, much different. But uh, we'd have all of our friends and then just go in the next day. All right, you got one day to relax before you go back to school. Okay, but I'm so hyped because of SummerSlam, you know? <laughs> like, I remember 92. Like, I was 10 years old. The one overseas. And now with the Road Warriors documentary, I learned some things about that SummerSlam. But those are the kind of ones I always think of. Yeah, you're talking about the new episode, Dark Side of the Ring. I've, I've sat down and I watched a few of them. And... I watched I watched one with Macho Man, Miss Elizabeth. I watched one with Dr. David Schultz. That had to be my favorite one so far. I watched the Montreal Screw Job. I watched that one, and I was watching. Started watching one with uh, Dino Bravo. I started watching that one there. I didn't get get to finish I, that. You one. know, I wasn't hype about that when it came out. Well, by the end of it, I was like, I need more of this content. Really, really. Because I, if you watch the whole episode, you find out what actually happened to him. If you don't know, yeah, then you're just like, I need more of how did we get from here to here, right? And of course, I watched the Crispin Wall one. I watched that two part one there. That was really emotional and driven, and it it brought up a lot of good points that you didn't really think about because it's like. Actually, if you look at it from this point of view, this could have happened. If you look from this point, that point of view, this could have happened. It it's it makes you think there because, and one thing I liked was how Jim Ross said that at that time they they didn't have all the facts and what they were reporting on because I I remember watching that shit live, man. Mm-hmm. I remember watching that, and then afterwards, then it was like silence. You never heard of him again. And it's just because they didn't have the facts and they made a screw up 
So that's understandable there. And it's an odd thing because, I mean, I work in the media. I worked in TV and radio for like 20 years, and I get it. I know how sensationalism works and how journalism works. You know, you want a clickbait headline that, hell, you click the thing, it's not even the same story. But I remember watching that live with like 10 of my friends. We were at a bar uh, that we went to to watch pay-per-views, and the beginning of it, when they ran the card down, we all sort of looked at each other like, wait a second. Something about the way that he said that doesn't ring right. Like, what's going Something's going on here. And then they get to the match, and Punk wins the belt and all that. Yeah. And I'm like, that's not how that was designed. You know, I, I've not really been around the, the inside of wrestling that long at this point, but that's not, I don't think that was supposed to happen. Something else is going on here. And then I was actually at work. at a t- I worked at a TV station. Mm-hmm. And in the next couple of days when things start to come out. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, now Nancy Grace is going to take everybody to task. Okay. <laughs> wrestling, do- wrestling fans, number one enemy right there. I, I can't stand her. What she and we actually had to edit a podcast that we did with Chris Hall uh, yeah. because he broke our cardinal rules, um, and they were all in relation to things that he said about her. We had three rules for the podcast, and only the guests know what it means, but... Um, things you can't say or can't talk about. And he did all three right in a row. And we're just like, bro, you can't <laughs> like this. Stop. Yeah. 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 That just going back on that there. Yeah. That was, that was a pretty shock And the dark side of the ring. They've, they've done really good there. I still haven't watched one on uh brawl for all. I think that's it or fall brawl or <laughs> it's brawl for all is interesting. Yeah. 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 Um, that one though, I think, is just everybody just calling Vince Russo an idiot, <laughs> which isn't completely wrong. But it's just here's Cornette pointing a finger, here's Jim Ross pointing a finger, and they both go at Russo. Well, the problem with that is, is you guys are all there for it. I mean, on some level, you know. And then Bart Gunn talks about it. it's really good, but I, I thoroughly enjoy what they're doing, and I'm also shocked at the amount of footage that they're given access to yeah given what they're doing with it yeah it's it's amazing what the, what they're given and they're using to tell this story or tell behind what really happened what went on this happened here and it led to this event right here and this is the final outcome of that event and it's really really insightful i i like insightful stuff like that Especially like with documentaries, I I like well, the documentaries. I don't series. know if this is a secret or not. I would imagine it's not, but all of the you see the fuzzy background, you know, when they reenact things. Yeah, those are all trained wrestlers that are doing that. Mm-hmm. As a, for instance, in the Road Warriors one, I saw it plain as day. Um, one of the where they're showing the jobbers, one of the jobbers is Jake something. And he's been on there a number of times, and he's been one of the the background guys. I'm trying to think. I think he was uh, Bruiser Brody. Okay. When they did that episode too, and it's cool to see because you're like, is that? And then you see on Twitter, of course, you know, someone called him out on it. Yeah. Of course it is. <laughs> a neat little touch, you know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you're gonna do a little reenactment, why not get someone in there that you know it makes it look real. Yeah, yeah, make it look real because you can't you can't just put anybody in that role there, an actor, because it'd be almost like one of those cheesy Lifetime movies. <laughs> right. Well, I'd imagine too. I I know it's a lot of uh, a lot of the Michigan guys mm-hmm. that have been down through Ohio uh, throughout the years because they shoot a lot of that in, in Canada. Yeah, and that's the reason why Chris Jericho had to be the voiceover for this year. Yeah, and not the other guy because. They were only allowed to do that with everything going on and the way the funding works. But I personally, I love Chris Jericho, so I'm okay with it. Yeah, I do too. He's he's evolved so much in the wrestling business. Everything that he's done from start from the beginning all the way to now, and it just seems like he just just keeps getting better and better and better, and just evolving with the business. He's he's taken a hold of it. He understands it and. That one, uh, that one year for um, the New Japan 
um, I can't believe I'm forgetting the name of their WrestleMania they have. Um, shit. Wrestle Kingdom. <laughs> yes, Wrestle Kingdom. Yeah. Omega and Jericho, the hype and the buildup to that, man, mm-hmm. was so great. It was so great. It was like old school Southern wrestling, man. You know? Well, and, you know, too, it kind of goes back to we were talking about Cody Hawk earlier on. He's He's kind of part of that generation with Jericho of – and there are a lot of guys like this, but these are always the two that pop into my mind of reinvention. And Cody's done that too. He's in the best shape of his life. Jericho's gotten in good shape and now he's carrying around a bat that he's named and it's a whole thing. But yeah, I remember that and thinking, well, Jericho's not going to be able to go out and do what Okada did. And and I love new Japan. Like that's like the, you know, when the world is right. Yeah. I order that every year. And my wife always finds me at like 5 a.m watching wrestling on January 4th every year, you know? <laughs> and I have it plugged into my TV, and I'm just sitting there like, well, when Okada and Omega did it, they didn't come out till like 8.15 in the morning. Yeah. Well, the show started at 4. <laughs> actually started at 3 because there's a battle royal, but um, I remember that that match with Jericho and just thinking, as they're walking down, how are they going to pull this off? Because Jericho's, they're not going to go out and do arm drags and drop kicks, and then the way they did it, it was just, oh, okay, I get it now. Kudos to you. Yeah, yeah, that was amazing. I liked I liked the press conferences they had. I liked it when Jericho was sitting there and all of a sudden Met Omega comes flying out and it just starts beating his ass right there. And Jericho's talking trash to the reporters and, and just keeping it real because they still keep kayfabe real over there because yeah. heels have their own locker room faces. You never see them like to do here in the states and i that's one thing i love about new japan wrestling how they keep that right there and just the matches and just the talent that's over there is just fantastic well and they have so much to draw back from i mean you know with not to go down a whole thing but with kenny omega you had the golden lovers with him and uh his partner and i I, you okay you put that over here in this box well that's from another promotion well they're not afraid to go uh give me a little bit of this all right cool well now we're going to put him with kenta and he's got all kinds of heat with him well all right let's put it together and see what happens and then magic it just mm-hmm. not all of it i mean not all of it's great like i don't like toro yanu because he just comes out with a book and it's just like a cheesy gimmick i know the dude can work He's yeah. making a ton of money. Who am I? But <laughs> you know, not every gimmick is for everyone. Right, right. That's 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 true. That is true. And the history. I a while back ago, I looked at the. They had like a video I found on YouTube of the history of the Bullet Club, and the Bullet Club was really big in New Japan. And yeah. when it came over to the states, damn it! It blew up and. I, I, I look at about three years ago how big Bullet Club was over here, how huge it was, and then compared to now. But it's still it's still a thing. It's still a thing over in New Japan from what I know. I know every, the members come and go out of Bullet Club, but, I mean, hell, there for a while, WWE had the two founding members of the Bullet Club. Now they only just got one of the founding members there. Because a lot of people yeah. realize that Finn Balor and uh, Carl Machine Gun Anderson were the f- two founding members of it. Yeah, and you know you've got I love Prince Devitt more way before everybody figured out you know who who that was going to be. But people don't understand like that's what I love about the Indies and about Japan is you can do creativity, and that's a guy that saw the ring and took advantage of it, just took off. I mean the anybody who didn't see his costumes and Pichu Rodriguez, my referee buddy and I talk about this all the time about, you know, the, the time he did the Joker was from the dark Knight was amazing. That's my favorite movie of all time, but yeah, the, he did that, you know, and, and he did, um, silence of lambs and he did all these costumes that were amazing. You know, you can't do that stuff all the time, but you can do it on big indie shows. It's kind of similar to the demon. I mean, he doesn't do it on every show, but mm-hmm. it's, uh, I love creativity, and I feel like not not to slam WWE, AEW, whatever, but you get to do that stuff more because 
your entire paycheck or your merch sales <laughs> relies on, hey, oh, that's that guy. Yeah, 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 it does. And I do like the fact that they pull it out for special special stuff, special event, uh, pay-per-views, because you see Finn Balor, you see him getting a feud storyline with someone, and then when it comes to a takeover, here comes the demon coming out there, and it's just it's fantastic. It's fantastic what he does. The, the theatrical aspect of Finn Balor is just amazing, and yeah, like like you said, he he has been doing this stuff for years on the indies, and then bringing it over to an audience, the casual audience, WWE, like, wow, this is great. You know, they think this is, you know, something new. No, he's been doing it for years, man. <laughs> yeah, but that's that nerd thing, you know, like, yeah. I'm 37. Like, this isn't, it's not catered to me. Yeah. Like, I watch all that stuff, you know. I I watch the Indies. I watch New Japan. I watch as much as I can get, and that stuff's not catered to me. But I'm the guy who appreciates it because... I've seen it and I'm like, oh yeah, that's cool. Wait till he does this. <laughs> Ding. Oh, there it is. Yeah. Like I, you know, there's so many. Like I watch mainly like for TV, like NXT and AEW every week. Those, those are my DVRs. I have to watch, and I always watch them in the same order. I always watch AEW first because for me, it's more of a fun show. Yeah. Whereas NXT, you know, is it, kind of heavy lately the way they've been doing it, but. Again, that goes back to you can't have everything be the same. But I, again, as I talked about, I'm not normal. I watch things kind of a different way, you know. <laughs> but I'm trying to learn, you know, new words or new ways to, to do things. And it's it's fascinating because a lot of those potential dream matchups, they're there. But guys sometimes surprise me. Like, I didn't know Velveteen Dream when he was Patrick on uh, Tough Enough. Yeah. And they said, dude, you you suck. You know what? You never know what's in a person's creativity box, and you never know how hard they're going to work. That dude is one of the best characters in wrestling now. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I love what he, what he does there, and I, I've got to see him. I got to see it live here in Daytona Beach when NXT would come to Daytona and do live shows. That, that was just, it was just fantastic. And I know last year they made up a makeup date because at the time they were supposed to come to Daytona. We had one of those damn hurricanes come through, and they postponed a date, and I forgot about which date it was, and my nephew's blown up my phone because I'm in the middle of that night doing a show, had my guest booked and everything, and he was like wanting me to blow it off. I'm like, what? <laughs> and I'm like, no, man. I already got, I got a good guest on. Everything's, I'm doing this, and he's blown up my phone. He's like, dude. Dude, you got to come to Daytona, man. I mean, you got to come out here. And he's sending me pictures. I'm doing a show. I'm looking down at my phone. There's pictures. And I forget which episode I was doing. But when I looked down at my phone, I was like, shit. <laughs> I was like, you know what? There, It's just, it wasn't <laughs> meant it wasn't meant for me to go out there that night. He sends me a picture of Imperial. They, uh, they showed up. Walter. And he's texting, Walter, oh, my God. And I'm just sitting there. I'm, like, shaking my head. I'm, like, you know what? I'm having a good time. What I do, I, it's just it wasn't meant for me to be there that, that night. See, we have, like, I've been fortunate enough that I've been to a lot of cool stuff. We went to WrestleMania in Detroit for 23. I've seen uh, Impact from, well, when it was TNA, from Universal Studios, both in the crowd and in the back. And I've got some friends down there. but. It, it's it's weird because like I appreciate the business like on a different scale now. Half the time, we this is not a secret. We got a couple comp tickets, and I we sit uh, on the side of the hard cam for like SmackDown and Raw, and I spend half the time just watching the production. But that's the nerd in me, you know. Yeah. It, it different people appreciate things different ways. But I mean, I remember uh, in Columbus, Columbus, Ohio, it would have been. Uh, what would that have been? Early 2000s. The Rock and Rob Van Dam. And it's right when RVD comes over with the whole alliance angle and everything. And The Rock is in Columbus, Ohio, standing on the set, uh, stage at Raw as the WCW champion. Never thought I would have ever seen that. And I'm just, we're just sitting there. Wow. Like, this is pretty cool. <laughs> but 
there's so many of those moments. We saw, you're talking about NXT. Yeah. Uh, some buddies to uh, the Agora is a historic venue in Cleveland, Ohio. And the main event of that show was Finn Balor, Samoa Joe, uh, Prince Pretty, and somebody else that's amazing. I forget who the fourth one was. It was a four-way, and it went like 25 minutes. Damn. Everybody got their stuff in, and we we did. I really just sat there. <laughs> okay, this is why I love wrestling, and sometimes you forget that. Yeah. Yeah. I There for a while, when I went to a few NXT shows that was live in Daytona, I would sit there, and I watched the whole match through my phone. I'm taking all these pictures, and... The last time I was doing that, I, I stopped myself halfway through and I said, you know what? I'm not enjoying this because right. I'm watching it through my phone. So I took a few pictures here and there. I put the phone away and I sat there and I watched it. I watched it. And that's something else, too, that that I realized and you probably see, too. Wrestling shows, you got a person in the front row there, right there. Actions right there. They're on their phone. They're on their phone. It's like, come but on. But that's any sport right yeah. now because I see people sitting behind home plate uh, in baseball games, and those are, shoot, anywhere from 1,000 to like 4,000 a game, depending on where you're at. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm on TV. Well, that's great, Marlins, man, but shut up. <laughs> uh, sorry, I don't like that guy. But uh, it is different, too, though, because we sit at the commentary table at different times for different shows and I'll I'll look around, you know, between matches or between segments, whatever, and you just see kind of that with a lot of a lot of people on their phones and then you see kids though and you realize why why everything is worth it, why these guys are going out and putting their their selves on the line and all that. Because there'll be a little kid in the front row who is just so enamored with whatever it is. I mean, <laughs> and there's also the stories where one of my favorite stories is, uh, at war a number of years ago. And I only believe this because I watched it happen. You have different levels of heels who people hate for whatever reason. Well, one of the guys comes through and this old lady takes a swing at him. <laughs> I mean, take a legit, like, full-on, I hate you, I'm going to knock you out, like, swing. And it was one of the, like, I started crying because Damn. it was one of the funniest things I've ever seen in my life. But <laughs> what people don't realize about uh, kind of the war thing, and, and I, don't, I don't know that you see it anywhere else because there are so many promotions who are good with bringing in talent, like five-star talent, you know, the hot indie guy, and, the, and they'll have these great matches, but there'll only be 30 people. And this isn't a right. war thing, because somebody's going to say this, but that's where I work. And I see these reactions of, for instance, there's a faction called the Michigan Invasion. Uh, Eddie Venom, Truth Martini, the great Nate Matson, Jamie Cox, they're all a part of this. And they come down from Detroit to Lima every month, and they did this for uh, 10 years and they're bad guys because they're from Michigan. Right. Like, you know, it's Ohio State country. That's right. the whole thing. You know, point to the hands and we tell you where Detroit is, all that. They got this tremendously great gimmick and uh, they bring a trash can out and they tried to burn a flag in the middle of the ring. Oh, uh, no way. <laughs> burn the, you know, the Ohio flag and then later a uh, character Caden Assad tried to do it with the American flag and somebody stopped him and it's what's too far, but years later, these people end up cheering the Michigan invasion. People in Ohio are cheering the Michigan invasion. Just, <laughs> you know, it's just funny how, like, they believe in the concept of good and evil. Right. You know, they don't care. You can do a 450 and then fall down, super kick a guy. Like, they don't care. It's different than a, a lot of places because it's that old school mentality, but. It's it's provided some interesting things. I mean, there was a an angle a number of years ago where one of the characters got hung from the ring post. Hung from the ring post? Yeah, you know, the leather strap around and they're pull the heels pulling back and everything and these fans jumped out of the crowd and started putting they put their hands underneath his feet and were trying to prop him up. <laughs> they believed you know, and that's what's great about it is 
for a span of two, three minutes, whatever, yeah, you know, you can make someone believe that you are willing to commit murder on a Saturday night, you know, at ten oh five in Lima, Ohio. <laughs> Damn. That's that's crazy, man. I've I've never heard never heard of anything like that. I know of course the grandma or the mother that thinks, hey, this is real and they they well, they get into it and they believe what's going on in front of them and try to take a swing, try to do something because that person's actually doing their job. If they're getting heat right. on them, they're doing their job, man, because that makes it even so much better. If you get that grandmother that's ready to jump over, granny, you know, the family's like, hey, how was your night tonight? Oh, it was great. Uh, we had to leave the wrestling show early because grandma tried to go over the rails. <laughs> oh, you'd be amazing. The amount of people I've seen kicked out of wrestling shows because, you know, it's still real to them, damn it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's 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 the thing I like about it. That's the thing I like, I like about it. I had Milton Mark Magnum on, and he he he's loves great. yeah he he's he's great man. Great conver- conversation. I don't know if you caught that episode I did with him, but just what he said in on on that on that uh, episode. Just he looks to interact with the fans. You know, give him something to give back to you because you're there for entertainment and enjoy enjoyed the show even jackson breeze said the same thing he's like come to fgw boo cheer me i don't care i'll give it back to you because that's interaction and that's that's what i like about the interaction but when a fan decides to get over that rail and become part of the show that's a problem right there that's a problem true but my problem has always been and uh ripper can attest to this at some point um when and I have a, uh, I don't want to say psychic color commentator now, Dusty Dillinger, and he's an old school disciple of Dusty Rhodes and a lot and Al Snow and a lot of these guys where he believes what you're talking about with the older school thing. But the problem for me is when those people come up and decide to be part of commentary oh, while God. I'm doing the match. <laughs> hey, can I get your autograph? <laughs> no, go away. And I mean, he's nice. He'll sign it. Whatever. Yeah. People would even ask for Ripper's autograph while it's going on, and he's the lowest form of human being. Like got that show, like he's been the longest. If you, we joke about this all the time. If you want to get a guy over as a bad guy in war, just put him with Ripper. Yeah, because he's got that universal like X Pac heat that people they don't even want to deal with it. Like they're just like, oh, that guy. Well, he's got to be a bad guy. Well, why? Because Ripper brings him out. Okay. Yes. I mean, yeah, He's, but it doesn't exist anymore though. That's, that's the thing is I talked to enough guys, whether it's on the podcast or just in general and the, everybody wants to be the cool heel because everybody wants to make money selling their stuff. Mm-hmm. Well, my favorite heels now are guys like MJF. You see an MJF shirt? Cause I don't Nope. The only shirts you see him wear are ones that they made for the angle. You know, like I pinned Cody and all that stuff, or I screwed Cody, whatever. But, like, that kid's 24 years old, and we have a, an episode of Tales from Andy's coming out with Danny Daniels. He worked there for about two years in Chicago, and he talks about how Max, as he calls him, he, he's like, that kid just gets it. He's like, he's 24 years old, and he just gets it. And... Uh, there's not a lot of guys like that, and it's it's kind of odd because even when I deal with heels now, it's all right, cool. Did anybody buy my stuff? Yeah. No, that's not the point. The only reason I uh, I get it, you know, the only reason a guy should want to buy your stuff is if he's gonna light it on fire in front of you. Yeah. Who cares? He bought it, but you shouldn't want to sell merch. You know, you want everybody. You want a cop escort out of the building every night. You want the four horsemen thing. Yeah. 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 That's that's. That's the thing with MJF. Yeah, he he does get it, and I love what he does. And yeah, where's MJF merch? You don't see it. Perfect. No, another per- perfect example. Since you bring that up, there, Tomaska Champa when he was heel. You see Tomaska shirt? No. When he turned face, then here comes the merchandise out. You know, and that's that's one thing I like about wrestling is you get that guy out there. Like perfect example. The Rock, 
a rock trash talk in the crowd for so long and just being that guy you love to hate. And then when that time came right, flip him and boom, he he shot off. Right. Like he broke oh. that ceiling, man. Ripper and I talk about all the time, you know, natural smart asses are meant to be heels because and that's kind of something I have to try to hide doing play by play is that's my natural inclination is to to be a certain way, but um, the Rock was I, like he always should have been a heel because when they did the Rocky Maivia thing, everybody just booed the hell out of it, and yeah. it, it was kind of great from a storyline perspective of, dude, you guys booed me the second I came out of the curtain. Now, granted, they gave him a reason because the gimmick sucked, <laughs> but it was oh okay, well, hmm, this guy's got to get over. Well, let's just let it. Let's just go. Let's just put him with the nation. Let's see what he does. Mm-hmm. It worked. Oh, that was that was some great stuff, man. That was great stuff. I liked how Ron Simmons Farouk. <laughs> I still my favorite thing of them was the Rock coming out there. He's like, the Rock has gifts for everybody. He goes, like, Rolex watch. Oh, I didn't forget about you, Farouk. A picture. <laughs> That shit was great. I just, just saw somewhere Ron Simmons told that story, and I met him in Cleveland one time, and I was actually more excited to meet him as a Florida State football fan than I was to meet, you know, the damn guy. Yeah. And I shook his hand, and you could tell, I mean, you know, the, the whole finger tape thing is not a gimmick. Like, that's his real, he's got arthritis, and he tried to shake my hand. And I'm like, that's not what I expected, but then I realized he's 50 and has arthritis. Yeah. Nicest yeah. dude ever. Yeah, he's for he, he's 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 pretty cool. I mean, Cody Fleming, who does Wrestling Rage MIW Weekly, he has a video up on his YouTube channel where he he's talking with Ron and Tony Atlas and just oh, hearing God. just yeah. <laughs> um, funny story about Tony Atlas. I I didn't think about this till you said his name. <laughs> so my buddy and I went to the Royal Rumble in Detroit in two thousand nine. So one where Santino gets eliminated in like two seconds. Yeah. Or depending on how you read the history book. But uh, <laughs> so we go, we stop. By, I think we're in Taylor, Michigan on the way home. We always stop at this same gas station. And we're going through, we're walking through. And we look over and I see this very well-dressed gentleman, 6'5", bald head, except for one strip. Who in the hell... Turns out it's the boogeyman, right? <laughs> so he's ordering hot dogs. So apparently he's sick of worms at this point. So my buddy's like, uh, hey, man, you know, I enjoyed the show tonight. And he's like, oh, brother, you must have me confused with someone else. And he's like, I'm pretty sure that's the boogeyman. Yeah. So he's like, no, nah. he like tries to play it off as he's getting his hot dogs. And I'm trying to think, he's got this really nice suit on. How the hell he's going to eat this hot dog with mustard, relish, catch up you know on this suit and i look over and as he says you must have me confused with someone else we look over and in the front door walks tony atlas and mark henry <laughs> and he's like oh come on boogie we gotta go ah <laughs> uh, and he, he's like you got me uh, so we walk over, you know mark henry shakes her hand and he's this is his hand this is my wrist all yeah. across you know but it just made me laugh because i'm like i no one's going to believe me that we met Tony Atlas, Boogeyman, and Mark Henry in a marathon in Taylor, Michigan. <laughs> no, that, that's 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 great. That's great. It's like when I watched that episode of Table 3 on WWE Network with uh, Ric Flair, Ricky the Dragon Steamboat, and I'm trying to think of who else was, was right there, too. And Flair was talking about Ricky or one of them was talking about the other one where they seen each other at a gas station. So there was fans around. So one of them had to play it off with, with the other one. I think it was flair had to play it off where they, they didn't want to break kayfabe. And that was, that was such a great story there, how they talked about it because seeing each other out in public, you run each other. It's like, uh Oh, you got fans around. What do you do? Play it off. Like you really hate this guy which I think is great. That's that, that's pretty cool that you got to meet uh, Boogeyman. And I, it's to- funny because over the years, I, I've been blessed and fortunate enough to 
this isn't the name dropping thing, but to uh, have met or worked with a number of people where childhood me is like, really? Like this is happening? You know, I, I, we used to have, we used to go to these shows in Fremont, Ohio for a promotion called hybrid pro wrestling. And there was this kid. I don't know if you've heard of him. Um, his name is Johnny Gargano. Yeah. I don't think he ever did anything. <laughs> Like I think, like he never got out of Cleveland, but uh, he used to be on that. And there was a, a show run by a guy named JT Lightning in Cleveland, and uh, CAPW, and he was up there, and he was kind of training. His dad owned, uh, or his stepdad owned a pizza parlor. And again, it goes back to Danny Daniels. He tells the same story on Tales from Indies that you know they worked up there, and and it was great. But we saw him in Fremont, and. Uh, couple of different times he was working christopher daniels is one of my all-time favorite wrestlers and i love the motor city machine guns and they were all there got to meet all them they were all cool and it's funny now looking at it uh, because that was like oh five now looking at it having done a very small amount of things in the in wrestling you can i can connect to like any of these people through one person like the kevin bacon thing and it, it makes me <laughs> laugh because i'm like all these people are like two phone calls away now. Like I never thought you'd get, you know, you kind of get to that point where you go, ah, oh, they're my contemporaries, contemporary, like, or they trained them or whatever. But yeah, it's cool because 98% of the people I've met in the wrestling business are cool as hell. Mm -hmm. There are a couple of dicks. I mean, you get that anywhere, but right. Uh, it, it's just kind of neat to to see those people, and then like you're saying, I've seen a couple of times where even with kids, where the guy realizes like, oh, like the heel, the face is coming. Oh, I got to be a dick to this kid now, <laughs> you know, because that's just the dynamic. But that's the role. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, yeah, that pretty much they they do that. They're, I mean, nowadays it don't, but I mean some of them still do. I mean, oh, it still certain, happens. Yeah, they 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 do. They they definitely do. With with you being being announcer as long as you've been doing it, you do sports too. What uh, what what do you do in sports? <laughs> yeah, name a sport. I've or probably, yeah. or what have you not done in Light sports? On your house, pay the bill. <laughs> I don't know what the hell just happened there. Um. <laughs> It's crazy because I work for a couple of radio stations and TV stations here in Ohio that um, call it broadcasting high school sports and some college is actually like my quote unquote real job, which sucks right now because <laughs> you know the world's gone to hell. Yeah, but uh, whatever. But uh, I do high school football, basketball, uh, baseball, softball, volleyball, soccer. I did water polo a couple times for TV. That was that was something different. <laughs> it's a totally different beast. Um, some different TV stuff, but it, it's it's weird though because it gives you kind of a a different view on. You have to call sports totally different than you call wrestling. And when Ripper and I started doing war DVDs back when we did DVDs and not everybody had a stream. Um, it was very hard for me because it was a weird transition of I was very robotic because uh -huh. football is next thing up, you know, right. you get a reprieve and, and it was, you know, drop kick, takedown, arm drag. It was like, what's coming next? And you try not to, you know, you know what it's going to be. Like I, I still to this day use the old Jim Ross thing mm -hmm. of getting sheets that don't have results on it. Yeah. Like, I know the performer, right? Like, you, you know, your finish is a super kick. Right. I know nine times out of ten, you hit that, you're not going to false it. Right. There's not going to be a false finish. But I don't want to, like, I can call it organically. Like, I'm better when I call it organically because I see it coming as a logical thing, not because I know you're winning. Right. And that's that's a very hard thing to do, and it's... It's very different from sports, so it took a, a while to do, and I still don't know that, you know, I wouldn't say I'm great at it, but I can tell stories, and that's three quarters of call and wrestling matches. You know, I don't know that I don't know how many people realize I have the smallest role in terms of let's just say it's a one-on-one -on -one match. 
Well, there's four or five people involved in that match because you have the two guys in the ring, you have the referee, and then the one or two people on commentary. You're all trying to accomplish the same thing. Right. Make right. this sound like the greatest match of all time or whatever it is, you know, you, you're trying to accomplish, but you add in the tag team, you know, you add two more people. Oh, you got almost seven people trying to tell the same story. Are you on the same boat? And it's hard with some performers where they're, there's nothing against them. They want to do it that way. There's uh, a lot of weekend performers. Mm-hmm. And you can tell, uh, I mean, you go to or see enough wrestling shows, you can, this is probably, I'll probably eat for this, but you can tell who is doing it for a living, you know, right. who wants to do it for a living, I should say, and who, you know, is, is just doing it because. And that's how they get their gimmick and how they can explain to you, you know, uh, I ha- I do a 450, but it's called, you know, whatever. Mm-hmm. Ah, you put time. You know who is your character? How do I, how do I help you put that over? Right. right. I'm not important. I'm not trying to say I'm anything. I'm just trying to trying to illustrate. You know, I need to help match what you're doing. Yeah. I don't think some guys get that. Right. Well, like like Jim Ross and. I, I believe like a lot of commentary people, they, they talk with the talent, they get to know that talent. And when they're calling their matches, then they know that when they're about to do a signature move, then the, you know, it's like they can throw a little bit more extra into it. Right. And then when they do the finished and, you know, you know, go joy, joy styles, <laughs> you know, and then you, you put it over and then, yeah, that's I I I I see where you're, where you're coming from. Oh, I totally it's get bad it. though too because I'm very I'm a very opinionated person. It's not good um, <laughs> for stuff like that. And like I hate AEW's booth right now, just because it's too much traffic. I mean, there's no like I always talk about uh, with broadcasting, and, and that might be it because I have more of a, a broadcasting background. Mm-hmm. Talk about traffic cops. You know, like at some point somebody has to be the guy to take charge and who's the AEW guy. Right. They're not because they're all like, you know, Tony Schiavone will let it happen, but the other two who's calling the match. Like I, I get lost watching it. And again, I realize I watch it differently, but I get lost watching it because is Jim Ross pulling the horse or is Excalibur? Exactly. Exactly. You're not, you're not the first person I've heard say that. You you listen to Jim Cornette. You listen to his podcast. Bit, yeah, yeah. Jim Jim Cornette mention mention on there. He he's he's had a problem with Excalibur. He's like pull that damn mask off. Why is he wearing I, a mask? Yeah. <laughs> he's like why why is the guy wearing a mask? And also too, just how the play by play and you know commentary is done. Jim Ross, you know. He praises Jim Ross because as long as he's doing it, and Tony Schiavone, and it's just Excalibur, in his point, is just there along. But then, yeah, I, it's like who's who's calling this here? But I I do. If it was just Tony and Jr., I would I'd definitely be happy because well, as long it wouldn't. As been doing I mean, it doesn't matter to me if it was Tony and Jr. or if it was Tony and Excalibur. It's just. Mm-hmm it's one voice like Tony is the MVP of that thing for me because he understands his role. And that's a very hard thing. You know, you put two guys together, it's hard enough to go uh, unless those two people get along. And again, that's, I go back to this, but it's why Ripper and I do so many things together because we get along on a level outside of that stuff. And those guys, I, I don't know if they get along because it's, we, there's an old uh, an old thing I thought a long time ago. It's called GYSI. Get your shit in. And it's the Matt Hardy thing too. He had kind of adopted it over the years, and um, that it seems to me that's what those two are doing, mm-hmm. kind of at the expense of the overall broadcast. That's yeah. why I thought Jericho was so great because he would take what Tony would give him, and then give it back to him in such a way of all right, I've put you further down that road. I've taken you to this top sign. Now you know you can turn left because I know what the next direction is. Yeah. 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 I 
I agree. Like I said, I, I, I watch and listen to things maybe a little bit differently or more critically than the average person. Oh, that's, 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 that's how you look at it. That's, that's how you look at it. And that's just, that's, that's you and that's your opinion. And with you're speaking from experience too. I also think JR has fallen off a step, but that's just me. Oh, <laughs> and yeah, but I, I, I love, I love some of the matches that JR has called over the years. The one that always sticks out the mind, you, you probably agree with me. Hell in a Cell, Mick Foley. God, that reaction he right there. He, didn't, he, he claims he didn't know the spot. Yeah. The cage spot. It was in Pittsburgh. Mm-hmm. And uh, he claims he didn't know they were going to do it. And those are the best things. Uh, War just put up. Uh, they did a... I'm trying to think of how it was described. A, <laughs> a combination of a ladder, a cage, and a scaffold match. Damn. Um, and it's Dusty Dillinger and Jock Sampson, and it's, I, I guess it's not a spoiler because it's been five years since we did the match, but um, in the ultimate thing, it's the, the scaffold version is you get tossed off. You can be tossed off at any time, but it's inside a cage. So one guy gets tossed off at the end, and then he reaches up and grabs the belt. I didn't know who was going over. Mm-hmm. So when the whole thing happens, I'd like to think, I gave a better version of the events than what would have been if I had known who it was because they do the rope a spot, you know, but that's kind of the same thing. He claims he didn't know. And it, I think it made for a much better thing because when you hear that call, my God, he's broken in half. He's legit. He's scared out of his mind because he doesn't know what the hell just happened. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's I think that's the best reaction right there when they don't know it and what the reaction there because it, it comes off more genuine because I mean that that right there it just talking about it I can hear it in the back of my head there you know it's like broken he's broken them in half and then I use that for other things like football uh-huh. big tackles oh, you oh my God he's got a family. <laughs> It's funny how you don't realize that. Like that's another thing I don't know. People realize, oh, wrestling's not popular. All right, cool. Have a conversation with like a thirteen year old boy and see how much of his lexicon is derived from random things that have happened in wrestling. Listen to any announcer and tell me during the course course of any one broadcast, you don't hear something and go, Pretty sure I've heard that before on wrestling TV. Yep. Yep. <laughs> yeah. All right. Yeah. Who who in, who inspires you on what you do with announcing and doing play play by play? Who Well who's the reason who I wanted favorites? to do it was Jim Ross. Jim Ross. But see that's a weird thing is now I have a catch twenty two of like I again we talked about earlier on, I love New Japan. Yeah. But I hated Jim Ross doing New Japan because I felt like he was there for a paycheck. Yeah. And didn't give a damn about, you know, like there were things where, he, oh, hey, uh, well, what's that story? You should know this. First of all, you're doing taped episodes. You could look that up. But he was always one because I, I now realize being in broadcasting that Vince McMahon in your ear. Jim Ross is a lot different than freelance Jim Ross. Yeah. You know, and that's kind of one of those weird things. I mean, it's it's such an odd thing because I know you've probably asked this to wrestlers before and they've given answers. And you could go back, let's say one you did a year ago, and ask them, and I bet it's completely different. It's such a fluid thing of, I mean, I... I I am a fan of a lot of, uh, I would say, regional sportscasters in Ohio because um, of their ability to give details. And it's a thing that I, it's kind of an odd thing if you do TV and radio, where when you get to video, you have to dumb it down because, well, I don't need to know that they're blue. I can see that they're blue. You know, so that's an odd thing. But yeah, Jim Ross was always one and... Like I love, I think I appreciate Tony Schiavone more now than I did back in the day because, again, he's kind of changed a little bit and it's it's not as in your face and 
kind of that thing. My dad always told people, this is so funny, when I was a kid that uh, he's like, my kid's going to be the next Chris Berman. He's like, because I knew everything about sports when I was a kid. Yeah. As I grew up, I realized that's not a good thing because he has a gimmick and that's just, you're limited by, that. that's the thing is like, people who are themselves inspire me because you, you can just, all right, I've maybe gotten or not gotten jobs over the years because I am who I am, but I don't apologize for that. So who I, who you see is who you get sort of thing. That's the weird thing between having a fake name and your real name doing wrestling and doing actual sports yeah. was the separation. Uh, and, and I had a hard time with that, but Ripper did a, did a, a great job of helping me and Dusty Dillinger did too of, you know, not only do you, have to explain what's going on you have to sort of do it as a character yeah you know you have to understand like and that i struggled with that coming from like a sports background Mm -hmm. of oh it isn't just one is one you know it's like oh it's something else and now how do you get to here but i i'm inspired by a lot of guys in the ring because aaron williams is a guy in Ohio that I think is drastically underrated. Mm-hmm. And this is kind of a part of a, the answer of a different question, but guys like him, because, you know, they've been fighting for 15 years to get to that next level. But it, he inspires me because, and there are a lot of guys like this, but he's one that always comes to my mind of how do I get to that next level? Well, you just got to keep kicking doors down and eventually one of those is the right door, but right. it's, an inspiration in terms of when I listen to things back, all right, why did this work? Why did this not work? Okay, I see. I approached this this way. Maybe if I had sort of turned the other way, ah, that's that's kind of neat. And it, you know, it, mm-hmm. it's kind of that thing. Yeah. Growing up, I loved on commentary. When I was a kid, I'd watch primetime wrestling. And... Gorilla Monsoon, Bobby the Brain Heenan. Bobby, just like we were talking about earlier, he believed in he, he, in what he did. And he would be doing commentary. He'd be Bobby the Brain, and he'd want to get his shit and pack it up and get out of there quick before mm-hmm. the fans come after him. And another one of my favorite, favorite moments is the barbershop incident. <laughs> when Michaels put Janetti through the window... And through the glass and Bobby the Brain Heenan's reaction and what he said, he said he was a coward. Look at him trying to escape. It's just great. <laughs> and that goes back to that thing about basically every every heel is just kind of their own version of being a dick. I yeah. mean, we've had that, you know, too, where I was talking about when I first started doing war DVDs, we shot them in post-production. And so we would sit in this makeshift studio in tip city ohio shout out to jl and uh ripper and i would try to get through these things and he would just try to crack me up because i've already seen the show i already know what happens (laughs) so he would just trip me up and he would say things like that you know the heel is always right basically is the mantra yeah and i would i would screw up so many takes because i would just laugh (laughs) eventually i realized what the secret to good commentary is yeah if you're trying to not screw up these takes, just ignore the heel. Yeah. <laughs> you can passively hear what, you know, chirp, 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 whatever, but don't listen to what he says. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And once I started doing that, now none, none of them phase me anymore. <laughs> you know, now I have Dusty Dillinger, who's a face, but he's the same way with that same sarcastic wit. And all right, well, that's great. Um. You know, it's like the the Gorilla Monsoon thing, the will you stop? Yeah. And what you don't realize is, is, this has always been an odd thing for me, is I listen or I watch so much different stuff, you have to fight the urge to even inadvertently say other people's things. Yeah. You know, like you want to describe something, well, all right, you hear about a guy who's tough. You hear about Steve Austin. Mm-hmm. Well, when you think Steve Austin's tough, what's the thing you hear S-O-B. in your head? SOB. Well, that and he's tougher than a $2 steak. Yeah. (laughs) All right. Well, sometimes inadvertently that comes out. So then you have to cover it up and say, 
as someone once said, or, you know, because you're not just straight out stealing their stuff. Right. But right. it is a weird balance at times of how do I react to this in the moment? Oh, don't use any of these things you're thinking of. Shoot. What am I going <laughs> to go up with, you know? It's like improv. Yeah, yeah. One, with doing an announcing, one one of the things I, I noticed and looked into when when I asked for some information on, on what you do with announcing play by play, DBI. Can you can you tell me tell me a little bit about that right there, what that's about? So the DBI is actually short for the Dustin Batdorf Invitational, and it's a is was I don't know how if we're doing it anymore, but it's a uh, it's a charity show in Northeast Ohio, usually in the the North Canton Canton area. And um, it's Juice Jennings founded it. Uh, his name is Anthony Batdorf. It was his brother Dustin. He passed away from drug addiction. And uh, Juice, being a wrestler, the one thing that he felt like he could do that he shared the love of wrestling with his brother Dustin was put together a charity show every year in his memory. And uh, they would donate the proceeds. They'd have it at a local church that they all belong to. And they have this big, gorgeous, beautiful building. I like. It's one of the oddest places I think I've ever been for a pro wrestling show or done a pro wrestling show. But the one that felt most like home because they have these beautiful spotlights and it's right in front of the stage that you can walk down. And it, it just, it was perfect. But starting with, I believe it was the second one, Juice asked me about doing play by play every year and said, Hey, this is your thing going forward. So they would donate the proceeds of, of the event to, um, it was called solace. Right. It's about stopping drug addiction in Stark County where, right. Maslin and Canton and all these towns are, but um, it was always a challenge for me because it was it was different in that you go out and you have your color guy for an entire show in most events. Well, this one, every match is a different or sometimes two different color guys mm-hmm. who are on the show, and it provided for some interesting moments. Yeah. And they always had a battle royal. This event was known for having a battle royal at the end where the last two guys then, it was, uh, there was actually two battle royals. There was one to get a spot in the finals because you usually have six guys. And then it would be a six-way match at the end where it would pair down to whoever won, won this event. Well, the last year with Juice moving to Florida, they did it under the Ohio Championship Wrestling banner. And it wasn't, I wasn't there. It was kind of a different show, but it was like a regular one of their shows. But it it always meant more to me because all the boys were working for free, you know, and they came from Michigan, Chicago, West Virginia. You know, they'd come from all over because they believed in the cause. And that's a very hard and rare thing to do nowadays is to get anybody to do anything out of the goodness of their heart. And there were some matches that, some of them worked, some of them were really good, and some of them I thought were good, but didn't really work with the crowd. You can't have hardcore matches in a church. Yeah. That's the lesson we learned. Yeah, the, that's, I'd say that. I be, liked it, but it wasn't, uh, it wasn't well received with the spaghetti and breadstick crowd. Oh. <laughs> wow. I, um, I, I think that's that's a really good good event there that with the proceeds with kicking addiction. That's 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 amazing, man. I, I like that and that's well, and that's awesome that you're it's part also of in the like wrestling that. business. I mean Yeah. <laughs> you know, there were a couple of those guys who unfortunately had their demons and you know, they kinda I think that was kind of a thing for them. It was like a cleansing thing of all right, I can be on the show, I can do some good. Yeah. That's 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 good. I I do like that and with the what the message is behind it and what, what the event's about. I I think it's fantastic, man. I where Juice is. He's somewhere down there in Florida. Yeah. I live in Daytona. So hey, he may I may have passed him on the streets in Daytona Beach. I may have not known I didn't think. He's working for a promotion down there for I'll have to see what it is. Yeah. I probably know Elite Championship Wrestling in Florida. 
What what promotion? Elite Championship Wrestling. Okay, I've I've heard of Elite. Uh, it says it's in the Panhandle. Yeah, I've. You know, other than that. Yeah, that's, everyone's elite. Yeah, that's way way up there, man. That's like near Tallahassee, there in the Panhandle, Panama. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I mean, everyone's elite or extreme or something. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's happened. Speaking of Ripper Blackheart earlier, I loved I loved the stuff that he did on FGW Shockwave, just the commentary and stuff. One of my favorite moments of FGW Shockwave with him on commentary when he was talking about Jay West looked like he stepped off the front cover of a J.C. Penney catalog like a Terminator. J.C. Penney's not ma- they're making Terminators. Look at Jay West there. I loved it. I talked about it with Jay West. He he was he was laughing about it. He thought it was great. Even mentioned it to Ripper. He thought it was great. And with you doing... He doesn't remember com- half the things that he says. What's That's that? the problem. He doesn't remember half the things he says. <laughs> but with with you guys doing commentary for war, you also have a podcast, Tales from the Indies. Tell me about that. And Jay West is actually coming up on one of the episodes, and he talks about the incident that you're referencing. Just totally unconnected. But that's really? the thing that actually, yeah. Um, yeah, oh no, Ripper loves to make fun of Jay West. And, you know, Jay's great because we talk a lot about how he just had a baby and how he's finding out what fatherhood is and whether or not that's a good thing or not um, for his sleep schedule. Yeah. But uh, it, it's great. See, uh, 2014, I think we started this podcast, and it was just kind of a way of. I, truthfully, it was a way for us to just bullshit with our friends. Mm-hmm. But I will tell you that it has come with some controversy because there were a couple of things that I've had to go back and edit out because we get into this thing where we tell our friends, hey, do it how you want. Now, the problem is is that we have a way we're going to go about it and that we're going to do it. It's just, it's just pretty much a sit down, kind of like this. You know, You sit down, I have a couple of things that I want to know or, or get to about each person. But for the most part, it's just kind of steering towards an hour and whatever happens happens. But there have been some episodes. And again, the first one was different because, uh, Jock Sampson finally won the war title and we shot this episode at 3 AM at a hotel in Lyme, Ohio. And there were 20 guys in the room and, uh, there was, a manager who's amazing and he did impressions. So Ric Flair called into the show at one point. <laughs> um, Dusty Rhodes, I think called in at one point, there were quite a few inebriated call-ins and I learned that it couldn't air in the form of the two hour nonsensical shit show that it was. So I spent, I'm not joking, eight hours editing this thing to oh, a usable uh, part of, I think, 38 minutes, I think is what it ended up being. There was so much of it. But <laughs> we found out that a couple of our friends, you know, well, should I do it in character or not? Well, that's kind of on you. I mean, most guys, to an extent, their character is who they are. Yeah. You know, just with the dial turned a different way. But. Uh, it's it's been a lot of fun. I will say one thing uh, it kind of pissed me off was a couple of years ago, I reached out to Tommy Dreamer mm-hmm. right when he was starting House of Hardcore. And uh, in the email, <laughs> I said, hey, we'd like for you to be on our, our show, Tales from Andes. I'll be damned if two and a half months later, I don't get this notification that Edge and Christian now have a segment on their podcast called Nails Nails from the Indies with Tommy Dreamer. (laughs) And I've been pissed about it ever since. Now, I don't know that those two things are connected, but they sure as hell did not have that segment before I emailed Tommy Dreamer about being on the show. Mm -hmm. By the way, he didn't do the show. Um, He didn't even give me an FU response, but whatever. Uh, So I don't know. I just thought that was weird, but it's a lot of fun. I mean, we've, we got away from it for a while just because 
there are times where I have more sports than I can do wrestling and basketball season runs from November to March and it's very hard sometimes to get together. Well, now I have equipment that I can do. We can do more phone interviews. So we've stacked up a bunch of them. We just had Austin Mannix on and he talked for two hours and I, I didn't cut any of it because I think it's a great two hours. Yeah. He really is knowledgeable and, and I love the gimmick and, you know, he's just a great dude. Um, this uh, next one coming up is Mysterious Movado, who <laughs> is another one where we had to decide, you know, is not a, I'm not giving anything away here. His name is Josh. Um, but are we talking to Josh or are we talking to Movado? <laughs> and if you've ever seen the Mysterious Movado, it's an alien gimmick. And there are a couple of times where I think maybe it crosses from one to the other, and we just sort of, okay, we know him. So, you know, uh, Jay West is coming up, and then uh, Danny Daniels. We've got a handful of other ones, but it's it's so much fun. I mean, we've been fortunate to interview so many great people. I was looking at the list. Uh, AJ Styles was on there. Joe Dombrowski had talked about earlier on. Uh, there's a guy named Dick Justice who – is uh, out of the Cleveland area and uh, Crimson, not the one that worked for TNA, but the one uh, in the Michigan area. Nate Madsen is one of my favorites because <laughs> we worked a show called CWAI, which is now kind of FGW. It's sort of a what it became thing. Right. And right. we sat down with Nate Madsen in this park. That's the that's the first weird part of it. <laughs> and he, we're like, all right, if you've ever, I don't know if you've ever talked to Nate Madsen. No, I, I, I haven't. Um, it has been told to me repeatedly that Nate will take a 30 second answer and turn it into four and a half minutes. <laughs> I talked for an hour and a half and told me, guys, I only have like 20 minutes. Cause he's got to go from Cincinnati back to, uh, North of Detroit. Right. Uh, guys, it's two hours. It's like an hour and a half, two hours long. Okay, <laughs> that's great. Um, <laughs> but, you know, and then Cody Hawk calls in the middle of it. He's like, hey, if you guys want to get paid, you should probably come to the bar. Well, hold on. I got to get Nate to shut up. <laughs> um, I learned a, a lesson that you can't record a podcast on a road trip, like physically in the car. I <laughs> uh, did it with uh, Sherman Tank and some other guys on the road in West Virginia. Yeah. And they worked for, uh, let's just say not the greatest promotion in West Virginia right before this. We had to erase it because the first take was maybe them talking shit about the promotion. <laughs> so, you know, there's that. But my favorite one is this. And I, I was pissed at Ripper when he was on your show and he didn't mention this. So, you know, Paul London is, right? Yeah, it was Paul on SmackDown. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Paul London is one of the greatest human beings I've ever met in my life. So we went to a Comic-Con in Strongsville, Ohio, just outside of Cleveland. And we got dicked around by the guy we were supposed to set up with. And, and it was a wrestling collectibles and, you know, that whole gimmick. Right, right. So this guy, I've been talking to him and he seemed all right. Hey, man, you know, we'd like to come set up to our podcast. You know, here's a link and, and blah, 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 whatever. Let us know if you need anything. No, you're cool. We'll have you set up. So it's at a Holiday Inn just off I-71. And we get there, and the guy goes, I, what are you here for? <laughs> well, here's the email, bro. Like, we're, you know, we're going to do this podcast. Well, who said it was okay? Well, whoever the hell Jeff is. <laughs> like, here's the... You know, so you're doing that thing. Like, that's how you know it's not going to go well. Yeah. Well, oh, I mean, okay, I guess that'll be $18. <laughs> $18. Ripper's standing behind me, right? So I'm like, <sighs> what was the look on his face, man? What was the look on his face? Dude, I thought he was going to hit the guy. <laughs> so, okay, so he pulls $18 out of his wallet. And there's three of us, right? Because we have a guy with us. Yeah. And he goes, he's like, all right, we're good. 
He goes, no, eighteen dollars each. Oh shit, no, eighteen dollars each. I swear to you, I swear to you, he says eighteen dollars <laughs> each. Like, luckily, I have a twenty in my. Like, I don't carry cash ever. Like, that's a, just a th- weird thing about me. Yeah. But uh, I'm like, are you kidding me? And I said some other things. <laughs> um. So Todd, the guy who's with us, a French guy, he pays too. And we go in, we get, and then we have to hunt down our own table. We get these chairs, and everybody's mean mugging us. Well, who told you? Well, go find the guy. Just piss off. So we sit down, and I look across the room, and we're trying to figure out, you know, he's supposed to have all these big names there. And we're like, all right, cool. All of them no showed. <laughs> um, I look across the room, and I see Virgil and Greg the Hammer Valentine. Oh, nice. Nice. Greg the Hammer, Virgil. Well, Greg the Hammer's worked in Cleveland for the Indies for a number of years. So, right. okay, well, he's you know, he was out of it. I was like, I'm not even going to deal with that. So, Ripper goes up to Virgil. <laughs> oh, no. This, <clears throat> this is good. I oh, it's tell. bad. <laughs> this is the only time I'll say this word, too, and I already apologize for you. You can edit this out. But this is how the story went. And it doesn't do it justice if I don't say it. So he goes up to Virgil and he says, uh, hey, um, you know, we have a podcast. We'd love to have you on, blah, blah, blah. It was real nice. You know, this is 9 o'clock in the morning on a Saturday. <sighs> Virgil's got his wrestling superstar Virgil banner and everything, you know. Oh, hey, brother. Uh, no, I, I got to I gotta sell my stuff. You know, uh, being on your little thing, uh, that don't make me any. Like, he oh, broke our brain. We were just looking what? at him. What? Like, did Virgil just use the words? I don't understand. So, okay. So we go sit back down and we're pissed. And I look over. About five minutes later, Paul London walks in. And he just, he was cool as hell. We just went up, talk, we we're just talking to him, whatever. And he sits behind uh, Virgil's banner and we got a bunch of pictures of him. And so we now call him DJ Paul London because <laughs> later he talks about music and stuff on the podcast. But, uh, he was lonely, Paul London, because he's in Virgil's little bo- traveling booth, right? So he's just sitting there with Virgil's little fake million dollar belt, and it's the greatest thing because Paul London's never met us before, and he comes and sits down. Then he tells a story about Virgil. <laughs> the gist of it is, is they were in Pittsburgh backstage at the Igloo when they used to run there. And he tells him, uh, Virgil comes up and says, looks at Paul London. He's got the long hair. He's a good-looking kid, you know, all right. that. And he says, you don't know Paul London. And just walks away. <laughs> and he's like, so it was at that point, I was just like, F Virgil. But he says it loud enough that Virgil, who's sitting on the other side of the room, heard him. And he didn't even turn around. Like, you know he heard him because he... You know when you yell, like, trying to get your dog to stop doing something, and it, its ears, yeah. like, perk up? Yeah, he did that. Yeah. But he didn't but, He didn't. I mean, he didn't say nothing. Those are the things you don't plan. You plan to just sit down and interview somebody, and then, you know, Virgil shows up. <laughs> I heard this old story where he was, he was doing a convention with uh, Ted DiBiase, and someone, someone brought a replica of the Million Dollar Belt, and Jeez. had it, had DiBiase sign it. Well, Virgil went in and signed it too, and uh, the value of it was already up when DiBiase signed it. The value of it, I heard, dropped because Virgil had his name on it. I don't know if you heard that. <laughs> I, I, I can honestly tell you, you could almost start a segment on this podcast where every time that you bring a guy on, just ask him if he has a Virgil story. <laughs> Because I I'm, guarantee MT you everyone has one. There's another famous <laughs> one where there's in Fremont, Ohio. There's a promoter. His name is Mr. Main Event. He also works at War, and this is where I heard the story. He comes out and he says, hey, uh, and actually we just told the story on Facebook the other day. Uh, Mr. Main Event was telling it. He says, uh, hey, man, who's who's the guy that you hate, basically, like who did the dumbest thing to you? And Orlando Christopher was another great indie worker in Michigan asked him this and he says well Virgil just came down to my promotion one time he's like I told him I had a spot whatever I didn't tell him he could wrestle or blah 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 
So he goes in, and he's supposed to work this show, and um, he's supposed to work this guy. And he says, Virgil, you're losing. He's like, you're going under. <laughs> he's like, bullshit. He said, well, let him take my finish. Because he was supposed to take this dude's finish. And uh, I think it was like a stunner. I think it's what I, whatever it was. And he's like, bullshit, I ain't doing that. <laughs> and he goes, let him take my finish. And I've heard the story from five people who were standing there backstage. Mm-hmm. Well, what was his, what's your finish? Is power slam. <laughs> Every one of them just sort of looked off in the distance. What? My power slam. Shut up. <laughs> like, come on now. I guarantee it. Trust me. That whoever's lined up, ask them if they have a Virgil story. I'm gonna have to. I may Maybe take you up segment on this show. I may. I may have to do that Virgil story. <laughs> I just may have. Oh, to. I guarantee it. Anybody who's been around the wrestling business any more than like five years has a Virgil story. <laughs> like Ripper's got like ten of them. I mean, Dusty dillinger has got a bunch of good ones. Uh, it's whoever you can think of. I guarantee you, they have a Virgil story. <laughs> I may. He's Kevin Bacon. I may have. He's, <laughs> Actually, he's Nicholas Cage. He's Nicholas Cage now. He's been. He did one good thing. A long time ago, and now he's just living off that. Yeah. <laughs> now he's showing up doing the Wicker Man. <laughs> Whatever other dumb things he's got going on. <laughs> that movie sucked. I'm sorry. <laughs> I hate that movie. <laughs> God dang. Two hours later, I'm like, they should just lit him on fire. <laughs> Or lit me on fire. It's the second worst movie I've ever seen. Uh damn. Wicker what? Wicker Man? The Wicker Man. Yeah. 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 The second worst movie I've ever seen. The worst movie I've ever seen was Michael Bay's The Island. Walked out of it twice. Worst Damn. I'm a I love movies. Worst I'd have to say the worst movie for me. It was one of those movies where it was good and then you kind of question some stuff happening here and there. And then the ending just... I don't know be that Jennifer Lawrence movie. Which, which Jennifer Lawrence movie? One, she's in space, and that, the dude kills her by waking her up, and I don't know what it's called. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, you're going to hate me for this, and I don't care because I look at things like you differently. I, I, no, don't use my words against me. Yeah, I'm using it, man. I'm using it. I'm using it. If hey, if I'm going to use something that you throw out there, I I tell you right up front, I'm going to use your words. <laughs> My wife does that to me all the time. It's fine. <laughs> I I enjoyed it. I I enjoyed it because of Chris because of a uh, because of a, Chris Pratt. Yeah, Chris Pratt because Guardians of the Galaxy. I I love what he did with the. He doesn't Frank. get a free pass. What he don't get? He doesn't get a free pass for that. Guardians of the Galaxy is good, but that doesn't give him pass for bullshit like this. Hey, I, re- I I didn't. I've never seen it. I read an article about it the other day, and it talked about think about how weird it is that basically he, because he's infatuated with her, uh, kills her essentially, and is like, "I love you." Yeah, and then she got she got pissed off, and then he basically sacrifices life so she can live but she chooses not to die or some stupid lifetime nonsense yeah yeah it but i mean come on plus plus you had damn i forget his name he's he's a good actor he was in underworld Lawrence fishburne no no not Lawrence fishburne i mean the other guy who was like the and he was like the android bartender i forget his damn name he played lucius in underworld the the ruler of the lichens, that guy. You know what I'm talking about. I don't I can't know even you... find that stupid movie. <laughs> <laughs> no, Lawrence Fishburne's in that movie. Yeah, Lawrence is in there, but there's another Andy guy. Garcia's in it. Yeah, yeah. At the end, at the end, Michael Sheen's seconds. in it. Mike, that's it. Michael Sheen. He played. Uh, he played uh, in the Underworld like se- Underworld series. Man, he played the head of the lichens. You what know, the hell? Well, that movie made three hundred million dollars. It did because of Jennifer Lawrence. Jesus. And because of uh, of Chris there, but 
I I love what he did with Guardians of the Galaxy, my favorite there. I've seen him in some other things here and there, but it's just Guardians just I just enjoy that much more. I mean, I love I the Jurassic World, not the last one, but the one before that. I like that with him in it. That's that's the one I that's one I like. Michael Sheen, yeah. Dude, he played he played in Underworld, head of the Lycans there, which was great. And it's funny because I was telling my wife this because back in the day she was into Twilight. And it's funny. And Underworld, he played head of the werewolves, and then on Twilight he played head of the vampires. <laughs> You're like, yeah, okay, whatever. He was also Parks and Rec, which for me is like The Office. Like, I don't like either one of them. <laughs> you I, take don't a like... lot of crap. I take a lot of crap about that, but I don't find either one of them funny. You don't like The Office? I don't. No. Never like, been a fan. Like Seinfeld? I love Seinfeld, but yeah. I worked. At, I didn't. I didn't like it when it was out, but I worked at a TV station where we ran repeats, mm-hmm. and I, I had nothing to do but watch it every day, so I think I sort of grew an appreciation for it. Um, the one of those that's the best that they don't have anymore is King of the Hill. Yeah, yeah, King of the Hill. I, yeah, I love King of the Hill. I wish they bring it back. I do too. I'm surprised screw it up. Yeah, I have Pluto TV, and I went on there and I was watching. I found the binge watch channels, and I found one of the MTV channels that was just been watching. <laughs> butthead man <laughs> I just watched the movie uh, yeah. I had one of the movie channels for free and I just watched that again Yeah, so I, stupid it's stupid but I grew up on that shit man I grew up in the 90s I was, I was a teenager in the 90s man early 90s when I was 13 14 Beavis and Butthead alternative music and just can't getting, do that on television yeah can't do that on television I remember, remember that when I was a kid when I was a kid in the 80s Transformers, Silverhawks, Thundercats. Yeah. My Voltron. grandma threw away my Thundercats. Thundercats? Yeah, she threw it away. <sighs> no. We had the, I had the castle and everything. My grandma came up and she's like, yeah. Uh, <laughs> your damn Thundercats probably just sit around in their castle smoking and drinking all day. <laughs> ah. Seven-year-old me didn't understand it. <laughs> Grandma character though. Yeah, you gotta love grandma. She says all kinds of things that I can't tell you now because they don't make any sense. <laughs> but yeah, no, people don't understand. Like I have this really weird warped sense of humor. AMC just brought back Creep Show, and I'm over the moon about it because it was awesome. My dad had uh, <laughs> had the worst. Uh, what's a nice way of saying this? the worst choice in movies of all time. Like, he loved B-movies. And I don't mean B-movies that are like, oh, that's cute. They screwed that up. It was supposed to be garbage. I mean, like, D-minus movies. Mm -hmm. Like, not Bruce Campbell, you know, like Evil Dead, like stuff like that. This is like um, Beyond Reanimator, um, Dr. Giggles, Killer Condom. Like, (laughs) just absolutely garbage, terrible movie. Like, the worst. Oh, uh, anything made by the studio uh, Troma. Yeah. Tromeo and Juliet, and Ripper loves this because we talk about this all the time, just because he's the one person who understands this because his mind is as warped as my dad's was. Mm-hmm. Um, but I have seen probably, you could name the 15 worst movies of all time, I've probably seen all 15 of them because <laughs> we would watch them and just laugh. I mean, Toxic Avenger 4 is quite possibly the worst freaking movie ever made. It's like they had $85 in like three and a half hours to blow, and they were just like, hey, you guys know Ron Jeremy, right? I got an idea. Let's bring him in. I'm telling you, if you can get through this movie, you should be smacked in the face and given $5. But smacked in the face first. Because Ron Jeremy takes a, uh, a white picket fence post through the back of the head and dies. Ah, It is. It is, and it is the worst looking CGI ever. But <laughs> it's my appreciation for my dad for all things that are terrible. <laughs> I I love independent movies with independent film directors, producers. When I pretty much started podcasting, I pretty much that's who I interviewed, and I do eventually. I do go back and forth, 
and I haven't done it in a while because I've been doing a lot of independent wrestlers, but I will throw in there during the week, I'll have an independent film director or producer that I know of because one week I'll have, I'll have, uh, about the same thing. Indie pro wrestlers and indie filmmakers. They're about the same screw up level. Yeah, but I love it. That's, that's my shit, man. You know, it's like we all, we, we all have something that we love and that's one of the things I love. It's one of the things I love. I ain't got to kill time somehow, I guess. <laughs> like I said, I mean, I've seen uh, as many bad movies. And now, uh, a couple of years ago, my dad passed away, so I actually have all of these movies. They're in my house. So I don't know what that says about me. <laughs> I've now inherited thousands of bad movies. Uh, well, you you sat there and watched them with them, right? Oh, yeah, for yeah. sure. Yeah. And well, it was like the highlight. You know, these are the things... Yeah. In the, the back wall of uh, IGA, which is a grocery store we used to have here, um, they used to have, you know, movies nobody would rent. Like, yeah, not anything bad, you know, not the back section, mm-hmm. but like cause it's a family grocery store, but like just shit that came out that they had to carry. Yeah. And they're like, nobody will rent this. Mm-hmm. Like <laughs> Friday night, we got uh, those the old school uh, dollar oven pizzas. You know, like a two liter and two of these terrible movies. Like that was Friday night. Like that was great. Mm-hmm. Also means I've seen a lot of terrible things in my life. So nothing faces me because <laughs> now I look at these movies and I'm like, uh, I can't go to, uh, it's just a thing as part of that. I can't go to haunted houses. Yeah. Because I know where they're hiding. Yeah. Because it's the age old thing now of where would you hide if you were me? Yeah. Oh, not in the brightly lit hallway. Probably right there in that dark. Co- oh, there he is. <laughs> you know, it's like it ruins you from that type of stuff. Yeah, yeah. But at least, I mean, you got those memories, which is great. Right. My my father, my father passed away in 2012, prostate cancer. He was 81. And growing up, I mentioned this plenty of times. That's watched watch watched the show here and. From what I've mentioned on being other on other podcast, growing up, we pretty much he about destroyed the TV every Saturday night when we were watching Saturday Night Wrestling. Me and my brother was right there with him. He was Dusty Rhodes fan, big Dusty Rhodes fan. Ric Flair come on TV. I I never seen someone jump up and start yelling and cussing at the TV and just almost like Steve Austin there just going off on that TV and then Jim Cornette come on he do the same thing and <laughs> I exaggerate and say like yeah neighbors walk by down the street and all of a sudden out come the front door comes flying our TV and they stop and they're like yep Mr. Everett just destroyed their TV Ric Flair <laughs> must have been on it <laughs> yeah, Ric Flair. yeah but he's in source of a lot of people's uh, nightmares yeah but my 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 dad I, that's one of the m- memories I have is just sitting there through the years just watching wrestling with him and him jumping up and getting all excited and stuff. This 70, 60-year-old man getting up and just having a good time and just those are memories that I always keep close to me. Well, I can tell you this is pretty much this is pretty much all you need. Oh, it went away. This is uh, my dad had these glasses on at my wedding reception. <laughs> to pretty much tell you i mean he was a character <laughs> just see stuff and just be like why what what is why are you doing this <laughs> show up at my baseball games wearing this uh uh like a merry-go-round like a carnival merry-go-round right mm-hmm. like little kids with the little bikes and everything yeah you know the big top that it would always have imagine that like as a hat yeah yeah that that was at my baseball games <laughs> like this is probably why I am how I am. <laughs> Didn't make any sense. Yeah, but you know, it's we'll we'll always we'll always remember those moments that that we will always remember of our parents. There, man. Oh, I remember because I look in the mirror and I go, "Oh, there's Ted." There, there goes my dog barking all over the place. He he gets excited whenever he my new bloopers this week. What's that? You got so many bloopers this week. I know. 
daughter hasn't walked in yet though <laughs> yeah that that right there rippers like don't cut that you got to keep that so that's uh pretty much um pretty much what um he, he told me to just keep <laughs> that because i didn't expect that i mean i knew she was here and a wife trying to keep quiet my dog and I'm muting the mic, and then all of a sudden, it's like she just comes walking up, and I'm in the middle. I lost train of thought, though, but I'm glad you enjoyed that moment. I yeah. laughed. <laughs> it's one of those moments, man. I just I can't cut it, so I decided to keep it. And I put it out there by itself, and people loved it. People Isn't loved that it. Isn't amazing? The things that you you know spend hours on and you're meticulous about and you go through, and I have this all the time. I, this is going to be amazing and put it out and it's like whatever it does like okay and then just something stupid you put out it's the biggest thing ever mm-hmm. wait a minute I didn't put any time into that that was not designed how it was supposed to be yeah <laughs> <Jerks. laughs> yeah I usually I usually have to like mute my mic on and off like when my wife's walking around like she was there just a second ago because she's crumbling up everything and making all this noise and I, have I do to that mute. all the time <laughs> I do when I have to call for something yeah yeah so I get you yeah you 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 get it yeah because this mic it picks up every loud noise I was doing a show one night where I'm sitting here just talking and stuff and she could she's going in going into the kitchen there and I don't don't know what was going on and all of a sudden I hear I hear like something going all and I'm like talking and I'm picking it up and I'm like I can't talk I gotta hit mute <laughs> hi honey <laughs> what are you no I'm just complimenting you <laughs> we're gonna keep this one in <laughs> What? Dinner's here. All right. All right. Thank you. Well, this is this has been great having this conversation with you today. Just talking about wrestling, talking about what you do with announcing with war wrestling, DBI, and tales from the indies, man. I've I've enjoyed it and especially talking about Virgil and just it's just it's been great. It's been really great. I've, I, I want to thank you for coming on here today and talking with me, Michael. Yeah, I appreciate it. And uh, anytime we could take a shot at Virgil, I'm all about it. <laughs> I know I got like five more Virgil stories, but that dude, just f that dude. <laughs> He's never hey. gonna watch this. His track phone doesn't have internet. It's fine. <laughs> hey, I'll get you back on, man. I definitely want to get you back on and and talk more with you because we can help. We can do like a three hour show. If we, if we, if we I, was gonna too. I was like, man, like I know how this is editing it on the other side of it. Like, shut up. <laughs> nah, it's all good. Man. Go away. Steer him in a direction you want. <laughs> it's all good. It, it's all good. But I do, I do want to thank you again for coming on and social media. Where where can people find more of Michael McCorm- McCormick at on social media? That guy. Um, yeah. uh, Facebook.com slash McCormick PBP, which is Twitter the exact same way, at McCormick PBP. And uh, Tales from the Indies is on there, Facebook.com slash Tales from the Indies. It's also on iTunes. It's on a bunch of other places. And uh, the episodes are great. I, I'm trying to re-upload a couple of them because uh, the – podcast host that have sucks and uh, made the old episodes unavailable. I think they got hit by the coronavirus. But uh, the site, not the people. It's just, yeah. But uh, no, they. It's there's a lot of stuff out there. Oh, and YouTube as well. You can look. Uh, I have a page and then World Wrestling has a page that has a bunch of stuff that we've done over the years. And a lot of people, again, if you turn on your TVs, you just might recognize. Nice. Thank you. Thank you so much. And before before I go here, I just want to mention Podcast C Network, your top source for independent podcasting. Head over to podcast.net for great content and great shows over on the website. Hit them up on Facebook, Podcast C Network. Give them a thumbs up and a follow. 
send them a tweet over on Twitter at PodcastCNet. Subscribe to their YouTube channel for video podcast over on Podcast City Network and on Twitch, Podcast City Network. If you want more Everett Lee, then hit me up on Facebook. Give me a thumbs up and a follow, Everett Lee Show. Twitter at the Everett Lore Score Lee. Instagram, Everett Lee Show. And audio portions of this podcast and previous release podcast. Head over to YouTube, the Everett Lee Show, Stitcher Radio, iTunes, Podbeam and iHeartRadio. Thank you so much, Michael, for coming on. And that's it for the Every Lee Show. And I will see you all again next week for another episode of the Everett Lee Show. 